Today's Parenting Great Kids podcast is brought to you by March of Dimes. You know, from prematurity to maternal death, the health issues facing families in this country are getting worse. March of Dimes is leading the fight for the health of all moms and babies. We won't stop looking for solutions to improve the lives of families through research, advocacy, and education. Please join us at www.marchofdimes.org slash Meg. And by Mark's mission, Way of the Warrior Kid. When mom used to ask him what's wrong, Mark would say, I'm fine. But with math, gym, and the class bully... Mark wasn't fine at all, until his Navy SEAL Uncle Jake came to visit. Number one New York Times best-selling author Jocko Willink is back with an empowering book about going from wimpy to warrior. Mark's mission, Way of the Warrior Kid. Visit wayofthewarriorkid.com to learn more. For 30 plus years, I've seen every type of child grow up. Instead of giving me what I wanted, she gave me what I needed, which was truth. Don't let emotions win. Let truth win. Do your very best, and you should have a lot of fun while you do it. And the better you get at something, the more fun you're going to have at something. You moms and dads are wired with everything you need to be a parent to a great kid. Welcome to Parenting Great Kids. This is episode number 54. I'm your host, Dr. Meg Meeker, and have I got a show for you today. We're going to be talking about raising kind kids. I have an awesome guest, Dr. Tom Lacona. And friends, when I interviewed Dr. Lacona, He had so much to say that I said, we're going to do a two-part podcast. So today is episode number 54. It's part one of my interview with Dr. Tom Lacona. So listen to this and make sure you listen to episode number 55, which is the second part of my conversation with Dr. Lacona. We're going to be talking about raising kind kids. Tom has his PhD in developmental psychology. He is a professor of education emeritus and founding director of the Center for the Fourth and Fifth R's, Respect and Responsibility, at the State University of New York at Cortland, where he's done national award-winning work in teacher and parent education. The book, Moral Education, a Handbook, calls Dr. Lacona the father of modern character education. A past president of the Association for Moral Education, Dr. Lacona speaks around the world on fostering moral values and character development in schools, families, and communities. His center's work was the subject of a New York Times magazine cover article called Teaching Johnny to Be Good, As always, I will share my points to ponder for you to start using right away. And remember, don't just download these episodes. Click subscribe. When you do that, you're joining my parenting revolution and every new episode will automatically show up in your subscribe list. I promise you won't regret it. And we'd love for you to write us a review on iTunes and let us know what you think. Also, we're on iTunes, but... The Parenting Great Kids podcast is also available in the Google Play Store and on Stitcher. So no matter where you get your podcast, subscribe today and don't miss a single episode. Parents, do you get sick and tired of hearing your kids argue, of your kids never listening to you, or do you feel sometimes that life at home is just out of control and negative? You know what? My husband and I raised four kids, and now we have a bunch of grandkids. I get it, and I can help you. Check out my great new course, Discipline with Courage and Kindness, right on my website, Meg Meeker, MD, and let's help bring more order and more fun back into your parenting. So parents, thanks for listening. This is episode number 54. Stay with us. Now, my points to ponder. Point to ponder number one, teach kindness. You know, I think one of the most disappointing experiences a parent has as a young parent is the first time you see your two or three-year-old be mean 
to another child or a sibling. You know, every one of us parents wants to believe that our wonderful children come out with a heart of gold full of grace and kindness and selflessness. But the truth is, that's not the way it is. Our children are born with a wonderful capacity for kindness, but a capacity for cruelty. And this doesn't mean that if you have an ornery child or your kids fight at home all the time, that they're mean kids or that they're they're hopeless. That's not true. The truth of the matter is kindness is something that has to be nurtured and taught. Sure, some kids are more naturally kind, their personalities are kinder, and some kids aren't. But our job as good parents is to teach every single one of our kids to be kind. So I have a challenge for you. Three times a week in the next month, Have your family sit together for a dinner, lunch, breakfast, a game, a family meeting, it doesn't matter, and have each child say something kind or positive about his or her siblings. And it wouldn't hurt to have your kids say something kind about you as well. And then I encourage you, mom or dad, to do the same things back to your kids. Here's a tip. You might want to warn your kids ahead of time this is what you're going to do so that you can give them a little bit of um, time to think about what they'd like to say. It can be pretty funny if you just ask kids on the spot to hear what they have to say. I remember one little friend of my, my son's, his mother did this and said, I want you to say right now something kind to your sister because you're not being nice to her. And he looked at her and he said, I love the way your teeth look when you eat egg salad because your braces make all the eggs stick. I mean, everybody's roared laughing. Point to ponder number two, model kindness. You know, our kids really are sponges and they're imitators. They mimic our words, our body language, inflections and mannerisms. And you have heard me talk about how identity forms in our children have heard me say that our kids watch us for clues about what we think about them and about life. So pay attention to how you talk to your kids, how you talk to your friends in front of your kids, how you talk to your spouse. You may find that sometimes you speak a little more critically than you want to or that you're constantly adding comments on how your kids or spouse could improve. If you're temperamental and critical, pay close attention to the thoughts that float into your mind before you speak and ask yourself, do you really want to say the things you're thinking? You know, we mothers typically overspeak to our kids. We feel if our kids don't get it the first, second, or third time, we'll tell them 15 times. And this drives our kids crazy. So be very careful not to overspeak and also on how we speak. Because sometimes when we don't want it to, a lot of criticism comes out. So train yourself to make, to be deliberate in making kind comments to everybody in your house. One more thing. It's really important to be kind to your kids and your spouse. It's also important to say kind things to yourself or about yourself out loud so your kids hear you say, you know what? I just made an awesome dinner, or man, I learned a great lesson at work today, or landed a great deal. You know, we teach our kids how to treat themselves, so you need a model kindness, not just to family members, but to yourself as well. Point number three, expect kindness in your home. Let everybody in your home know that the house rules are that we are to speak kindly to one another. You want your home to be a place of comfort and respite from a really hard world for everybody in the family. And so home needs to be restful. It needs to be safe. It needs to be a a comfortable place. Yeah, it's a place where everybody argues sometimes, but fundamentally you want it to be a, a, a comfortable place for everybody in the home where they feel they can be who they authentically are. So tell each of your kids and your spouse that kindness needs to be represented and practice. Let them know that school, athletics, and any other activities may be places where a lot of criticism goes on, but when they come home, the criticism stops. This is a place where we build each other up, 
We have one another's back. We can disagree on anything we want to disagree on. But at the end of the day, we're family. We have one another's back. We respect each other and we're kind to one another. And the cool thing about kids is when you raise the bar on their behavior, that's where they go. You lower the bar, that's where they go. So ask each family member this week to help you make your home a place where Everyone works to create a kinder home. And another cool thing about kids is they love to be part of a group working to accomplish a common goal. It makes them feel good and valuable. And it gives them a a better self-esteem. Now, friends, I want you to listen in on a conversation I had with Dr. Tom Lacona. I know you're really going to enjoy this one. Well, I'm so excited to have my friend, Dr. Tom Lacona here talking about his book, How to Raise Kind Kids. Tom, thanks so much for joining me. It's my delight to be with you, Meg. I have tremendous admiration for your work, and I'm very grateful to have a chance to talk with you. Thank you. Well, this book is fabulous. It's just a fabulous, one of the best parenting books I've ever read, and so I hope it's one of, I hope it's one of your biggest uh, sellers. Raising Kind Kids. I can't imagine a parent out there in America or globally, wherever they're listening to our podcast, who wouldn't say, of course, I want my kids to be kind. And, you know, we start out, our kids are born, they're six months old, one month old, then they hit the twos. And that first time your darling little two-year-old son or daughter walks up to a sibling and whaps them on the head with a toy, we think, oh my gosh, who is this person? Is there a chance of me helping this child become kind as they get older. Um, Is kindness a personality trait or is it something that a parent has to nurture in a child? Well, it's really both. Some kids come by kindness more easily. They are sympathetic from the start. They share readily with peers and siblings. They help around the house without a hassle. Um, With other kids, it's much more of a struggle. Um, they're strong-willed, uncooperative, um, maybe aggressive. And I remember the shock that uh, we have 14 grandchildren, and we have um, a lovely granddaughter, Olivia, who's now 16. But when she was just maybe not quite two, she whacked one of her brothers over the head with a toy violin, and her parents were absolutely shocked. They were looking forward right. to having a little girl. They had, had two boys. Right, and, right. You know, and, she, well, you know, and here they had this child and, and Matthew would say, you know, Olivia is our, our most violent child. What's going on? Well, now that did pass. And so yeah. we, we needn't be shocked by these things. So in some cases, it's experimental behavior. In other cases, it's, it, it's, it might be a momentary reaction to something. But there's a lot of research that does tell us that every child has the capacity for kindness. There was an ingenious experiment done by uh, uh, the Max Planck Institute in Germany where an adult formed a series of tasks in front of a toddler, such as knocking over a stack of books or actually accidentally dropping something. Mm-hmm. And they wondered, how would the observing toddler respond? And every single case, every one of the, the toddlers observing these, quotes, accidents, spontaneously helped the adult. Yeah, they went over to, crawled over to get something if they were crawling, or they walked over and, and then returned it to the adult and and they Aww. did this regardless of whether or not the parent was present, and and even if the adult didn't thank them for this helping behavior. And that, so that was a response, spontaneous helpfulness in every Aww. single child. So the capacity is there. It's our challenge to nurture it, to try to make it more, more of a habit, to draw out the best in our children. Awesome. Because I agree with you, and it's interesting – I, from my experience, and I've practiced pediatrics a little over 30 years now, so I've seen a whole generation of kids grow up, and the kids who start out being, you know, a little more on the aggressive, meaner side, you know, three, four, five, six years of age, aren't necessarily that way when they hit their teen years. So I really want to encourage parents that, that what you see in your um, preschooler or your early elementary aged child isn't necessarily the way they're going to end up. So, so to 
dive in there and really nurture kindness in your in your kids. I think that's really important. I'm so grateful that you alluded to that experiment. You know, we're living in a in a tough culture. And while our culture would say, you know, we have microaggression classes for college students, be nice, be nice, don't hurt anybody's feelings. The truth of the matter is our culture is pretty tough. Um, How does our culture promote or not promote kindness in kids? Well, fortunately, there is something like a kindness movement afoot. There's the Choose Kind movement that was actually stimulated by by the book Wonder. The film came out last November. It's a wonderful chapter book for kids. I encourage parents to use it as a read aloud and also to see the movie. And and it encourages kids to reach out to others, including kids who are victims of cruelty in school. The Mm -hmm. boy in the movie and the boy in the book uh, had a severe facial deformity. Many kids were brutally unkind to him, but there were some children who, who reached out, befriended him, and it made all the difference in his life. So you know, there, there is a reaction against the cruelty in our culture, an effort to, to try to promote kindness in all, all sorts of different ways. And yet, taken as a whole, the culture is problematic. It's, it's increasingly a violent culture. Yeah. The school shootings have all had us reeling. The, the, the news tends to highlight that and to create a distorted perception of the world. This is normal behavior. We're living in an uncivil culture where our public leaders are often terrible examples of how to interact. Right. So kids get examples of that. And it's not just limited to our own culture. I mean, in, in England, where courtesy was always a cherished virtue, about 15 years ago, they had to establish a national courtesy day because there was so much rudeness that had become a, a dominant factor in British life. So many cultures struggle with this. Part of it's the media. Part of it's uh, breakdown of families. And then there's there's the pornographic culture, which is a, a new element of toxicity that that parents have to deal with, that children have to deal with. It's it's all around kids. If they don't seek it out, it seeks them, or their friends will show them something on a laptop or a cell phone. And so we have to try to prepare our children how to respond to that. There's a wonderful book, Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, that I routinely recommend to parents now that you can read to a child as young as six to help wow. them know how to respond if, if somebody shows them a pornographic picture. Yeah. So it's a tough culture, tougher to grow up in, tougher to parent in. I think that's a real difficult tension for parents to hit there um, between wanting to be kind, wanting to be generous, wanting to be wanting your child to be kind, generous and loving. And yet at the same time, not being overly ambitious to please people. You know, you want to sort of trust people, but they also have to be on guard. So so they're on guard and not trusting people. And yet they want to be loving and kind. And that's really I think that's really hard for parents because there's a vulnerability issue there. You know, if you're, it, it seems that if you're going to teach a child to be kind, you're teaching your child to be vulnerable to some degree because a child could be kind to another person and then be hit in the face. Um, and, and no parent wants their child to, um, you know, to be hurt. So how do you help parents say, okay, I'm going to teach you to be loving and kind and generous and giving, and yet at the same time, protect yourself from being hurt by classmates? I think that's an excellent question. And and it's true that a lot of parents worry if they teach their children to be good in any way, kind or just plain old to be good. They're not preparing them for a world where other people are ruthless, intensely competitive. It will take advantage of them and so on. So we do need to prepare our children before they go out the door. They're going to meet some pretty mean customers. Other kids right. are not going to be kind. Even kids sometimes who are being raised by well-meaning parents right. still have the capacity for cruelty. And then there's the behavior of the pack. Children in groups often behave at the lowest level because of the peer influence. So we need to prepare our children for that, to, to even role play how to handle a situation where somebody comes up and and pushes them into the mud in the playground or or calls and names, or whatever, and to know to, uh, f- first of all, go and seek the help of a trusted adult, a teacher. Uh, second, to be with a good a friend, because kids who are alone are much more vulnerable, likely to be picked on by bullies than kids who have a friend with them. So to have an ally uh, to tell you what has happened so that you're in the loop and can respond and counsel them and so on. And, and even in to have a sort of self-confidence that sends out signals 
don't mess with me. I, I really believe in self-defense for children, even elementary school age. I think it's much better than the typical PA that kids get. Because when children have, have learned self-defense, first of all, there's a philosophy that goes with it that says you use it only when absolutely necessary. You try to avoid violent conflict. You try to steer clear of it in every way you can. But if you have to, you do know how to defend yourself. And when you have those skills and you know that you can defend yourself, you send off signals that basically tell other kids, don't mess with me. Children who feel vulnerable send vulnerability signals, and bullies tend to have a sense of what's good prey. That's great advice. I remember we have uh, three daughters. Our kids are grown adults now. We also have grandchildren, but three daughters and our son was the baby of the family, but he was the biggest in the family. He's tall. He's six foot three, and he was always tall and and kind of a, a real strong physical presence. And I remember telling him when he was in grade school, look, you're out on the playground and people don't mess with you, but if you see somebody else out there being bullied, I expect you to go up to that bully and intervene. Now, maybe that was stepping over the line as a mother and I shouldn't have done that, but I kind of felt, you know what? I think we need to create, help create a culture in our schools where bullying is not okay. And if somebody is caught bullying, that somebody's going to say, hey, knock it off. You know, that that I expect you, son, um, since you give out this air that nobody should mess with you, to sort of extend that to students who might be more vulnerable. Because, you know, in, in middle school and junior high, some boys are four feet tall, some boys are six foot five, and, and they're all the same age. It, it's really, really, school's just hard for kids. Parents, I hope you're enjoying my conversation with Dr. Tom Lacona. We need to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more of my conversation with Dr. Tom Lacona. What moms out there can relate to the frustration of feeling like you're constantly replacing the items that you send to daycare and school with your kids? Mabel's Labels Stylish durable labels are the perfect solution for all the stuff your kids lose. Finally, say goodbye to those costly replacements and journey mix-ups. Simply personalize your labels online and they'll get shipped for free to your door, ready to peel and stick on all your bottles, clothing, lunch boxes, and more. And because they're laundry and dishwasher safe and available in so many fun colors and designs, they're sure to become your new household must-have. Visit MabelsLabels.com slash Great Kids today to start customizing your own. And if you use the code Great Kids, you'll get 20% off your next order. Again, that's MabelsLabels.com slash Great Kids and promo code Great Kids for 20% off your next order. Friends, as a busy parent, it's really hard to find the time and energy to make sure you're eating well and eating right. Sunbasket makes it easy and convenient to cook healthy, delicious meals at home, no matter how much experience you have in the kitchen. That way, your family can eat better, feel better, and skip the grocery store at the same time. Just go to the Sunbasket app, and pick from 18 weekly recipes like fully loaded beef tacos with Mexican simmer sauce. There are paleo, gluten-free, lean and clean, vegan, Mediterranean, family options, and more. Sun Basket works with the best farms and suppliers to bring you fresh, organic produce and responsibly raise meats and seafood. Everything is pre-measured and easy to prep. You can get a healthy and delicious meal on the table in about 30 minutes. And you know, there's something for every healthy journey and every busy lifestyle. You, my wonderful listeners, know I love Sunbasket and I love to cook. But I love it when Sunbasket sends me the meals I use, fresh ingredients, wonderful meats, and the spice combinations and the recipes they come up with are awesome. I just had chorizo chili last night with poblano peppers. I don't think I've ever used a poblano pepper in my life. It was wonderful. So please go to sunbasket.com slash Meg today to learn more and get $35 off your first order. That's sunbasket.com slash Meg for $35 off sunbasket.com slash Meg. 
I want to keep moving in your book, How to Raise Kind Kids, because it's so good. And, and you describe six key principles to creating a positive family culture. And I love that you talk about the whole idea that nurturing kindness begins in the family unit and that structure you talk one make character a top priority love your children exercise authority wisely give your kids a voice and a responsibility in the family love that extend compassion beyond the family and foster a noble vision of life will you talk about how you give your kids a voice and responsibility in the family and why that's important. Well, a lot of parents get discouraged in family life because kids fight, they don't obey, they don't do their chores without complaining, and it seems like you're always swimming upstream. You come home maybe from the work day, you're tired, you don't have a lot of patience, and family life starts to seem like nonstop conflict. Now, conflicts are inevitable, they go with the territory. But how do you deal with the real stresses of family life in modern society where we're all too busy, et cetera? Well, one of the ways is to decide early on that the family has to pull together. There's no free ride. There's no free lunch. Kids have a role to play, a contribution to make. A lot of parents make a huge mistake of not expecting kids to do chores, or if they do chores, they pay them. The chore is the way a child gives back to the family. They get a roof over their head, meals on the table, bed to sleep in, people who love them, and so on. A chore is a simple way of saying, hey, I'm on the team. I do my part. And kids feel proud in that. You can give that that sort of responsibility really early in life, even to quite young children, for example. Here's a mom who speaks of how she, she started that sort of training with children even in the preschool years. She said, ever since my kids have been able to walk, I made them pick up their toys. When we were expecting another baby, I explained I'd be very busy with the baby. I would need their help. My three-year-old brings the wash down every day, gets the diapers when I need them. He feels good about helping be part of the family, and he understands that by helping me do things, he gives me more time to do things with him. So the responsibility thing is is hugely important. Now, the voice in the family is also critical because kids are are like us. We don't like to be bossed around. We, We like to be able to have a say, and you can... Work out a system for chores where children have input. You say, okay, you know, who's going to do what? How do we make this fair? And and they have a, a voice around the table, and, and then you can involve them in changing it up. Okay, um, is this time to it's time to rotate chores? You know, what can we do to make things a little more interesting next month? So there's no negotiating whether or not you contribute to the family. What is something that's up for discussion is what's a good system, what's a fair system. Yeah. Kids can have a voice in that, and when they do. They start to feel ownership, and you're bringing them into role to the role of being co-creators of a happy family. That's not all on your shoulders. The message is, if there's a problem, we have to fix it through a family meeting, through this kind of discussion, and, and this is a team. We're all on it. I love it. I love it. You know, and a lot of times parents will say, but, you know, when I tell my kids to do chores or I give them a list, they, they argue and they fight and they make life so miserable, I give up. And I said, don't give up because you're robbing them of something that's critically important. And I love how to describe that. Kids need to know they fit somewhere. They need to know that they're an integral part of a bigger unit and that unit has to be the family. And I fear sometimes that parents who are very tired, uh, maybe they're both working full time outside the home, they spend a couple hours in the evening at best with the kids, and they're just trying to sort of do damage control and get by. And I, to really sort of try to push through that and say, please, please, your kids will wear it as a badge of honor if you expect participation and you expect to them and say, I need you here. I need you to do your laundry, to help cook meals, whatever it is. And they really do wear that as a badge of honor. I also think sometimes parents are afraid to give their kids a voice because they don't really want to hear what their kids have to say, because sometimes the kids are going to be very critical, cynical, they're going to fight. So how do you encourage your kids to sort of have a voice and express their opinion, but do so in a way that's tolerable for everybody? Well, you teach ways of talking in a respectful manner. If you're going to do family meetings, which is one of the, I think, the master strategies that can really improve the quality of family life, teach character, give kids listening and speaking skills that will serve them for a lifetime, 
you have to lay down some ground rules. All right, what's going to help us have good talking, good listening, and have a discussion that's really a, a cooperation to solve a problem? It's, it's, family meeting is not about blaming anybody. It's about how to make next week better than last week, solve a problem that we were struggling with, bedtime hassles, uh, struggles getting off to school, fights over screens, whatever the problem is, you know, how can we make next week go more smoothly? But you need ground rules for discussion in order for the interaction not to slide into finger pointing and accusation. And then those are skills that have to be practiced. All these things require practice. Really, virtues are habits. Habits develop through lots and lots of practice. I think as parents, we often slip into thinking all we have to do is tell our kids, don't do this or do that. And we hear ourselves saying, how many times do I have to tell you? Right. Well, words, words don't do the whole job. We know if we teach our kids a sport, how to hit a ball or play any, any kind of a sport, shoot a basket, that requires a tremendous amount of practice. You gradually get better at the skill. You need corrective feedback. And with time, it becomes part of what's natural. Same thing with character. It's a matter of doing it over and over and over until it becomes increasingly natural and easier to do. Thank you so much for saying that because I think a lot of times parents think if they just say to a child, stop doing that, stop doing that, stop doing that, the child's going to stop doing that. The problem is you have to train bad habits out of a child and use a lot of we language. Like I've noticed that, you know, you're, you've developed bad habit of talking back, let's say. So I am going to help you break this bad habit and how how we are going to approach this. So you kind of depersonalize it. But I think that that's, it's really important to, to understand, for parents to understand that training bad habits out of kids takes a lot of practice and time. And training good habits into them takes a lot of practice and time. So, you know, I often tell parents, if, you know, your job is to get your child to 25 and then you're really kind of done because that's when full brain development happens, frontal lobe, um, you know, more sophisticated thought process. We know that. So if you're dealing with a really snarky 16 year old and you can't get that child to break bad habits, don't worry. <laughs> Here's the good news, bad news. You've got nine years left to work at it. You know, so, so in other words, don't give up, but just keep going. Talk to me about fostering a noble vision of life, because that's one of your key principles in creating a positive family culture. What do you mean by parents fostering a noble vision of life in the family? Well, lots of kids struggle with depression. Um, they're in a culture that tells them being beautiful makes you happy. Sexual pleasure makes you happy. Being endlessly healthy is the secret to happiness. Uh, having lots of money, being popular, all these things. And they're all essentially lies. Those things don't make us happy. What makes us happy is a sense of meaning and purpose. What's my life about? Why am I on the planet? Um, what, what really creates authentic happiness? And we know that one answer to that is love. Um, if you have yes. a religious faith, you believe it's loving God and loving your neighbor. But getting out of ourselves and having an orientation toward other people, contributing to their happiness, one of the best, um, there's a story about Alfred Adler, a psychiatrist, who said that when people came to him for depression, they, he would say, well, do you wish to be cured? And they well, certainly, that's why I'm here. And he said, well, all right, I'm going to write you a prescription that will be almost uh, guaranteed to cure your depression. And he would hand them a piece of paper that would say, every day, do something to make another person happy. Wow. And, and in yeah. fact, that is one of the best antidotes to, to being depressed, is to focus on, on the needs of others, and to do community service, to help around the house, to be sensitive to somebody else's disappointment, to try to console them, and so on. So we, our kids need to have a sense of meaning. And of course, that takes us into to a question like, well, what's the meaning of life? Uh, is this life all there is? And every parent has to face life's largest questions on an adult level. Is there a God, for example? Is right. there life after death? I mean, I gave a talk at a nearby school not too long ago, and a mother said, because I always make a, at the end of the, the talk is always about spiritual development, and I, and I talk about the research that shows that children who have a religious faith and practice it are less likely to get involved in sex, drugs, and drinking, more likely to be altruistic, and so on. We have hard evidence that religion makes that kind of positive difference in character development. Yes. And then I'll talk about how you can try to foster that in family life through through modeling it, um, through having it be important in your own life, through through worship together, through prayer, through various rituals, and so on. But this mom raised her hand. She said, "Well, I don't know what I believe about God. It's you know, I'm I'm still struggling with that myself." 
So, Tom, when this mother said to you, I really want to help my daughter and answer deeper questions, but I'm not sure what I think about God, what did you say to her? Well, she wasn't sure how to start the conversation. So I said, look, be honest. Just tell her the truth. Say, um, this is the biggest question there is, probably. Is there a God? What does it mean for me? And I don't know what I think. I'm struggling with it. But it's not a question you can not deal with if you're a thinking person. So just be honest. Tell her what you're going through. But you want her to have the experience of thinking about this and and going to church so she has a basis for making an informed decision. And, And so that's how I encourage the mom to approach it. And if she took her daughter to church... I think one of the things that she would immediately feel good about is that there there would be a support system for staying out of trouble, for treating people well, for getting involved in healthy activities like service, for not messing around with sex, drugs, drinking. Because the research shows that kids who do practice their faith, as I mentioned, are less likely to be involved in self-destructive activity. And it's because they choose friends who are not doing those kinds of things. And, right. and young people need friends who share their values and keep them on the straight and narrow. So that's, you know, that's one thing that that mom could have done. In addition to continuing her own quest for a a sense of whether there is in fact a God, she ought to try praying. Um, Sometimes if you don't have a prayer life, you could just start out by saying, God, I don't know if you're up there, but you know, I'm going to give this a try. And uh, as we draw near to God, God draws near to us. I'm so br- I'm so glad you brought that up because the truth of the matter is, you know, you and I look at research, we look at science, we look at what science is telling us kids want and need and what helps them um, get on a, a solid footing in life and helps them do well and stay out of all the bad stuff. And the truth of the matter is the research shows that God is good for kids. And yet a lot of parents sort of say, well, I don't want to push my beliefs and values onto my kids. And I say, well, but you know, you, 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 you're doing that already. If you are not talking to your kids about God, your kids are wondering those, they have questions about God and they will find answers somewhere if they don't find them at home. So it really, you're teaching them about everything else in life. Why ignore teaching them, that, them about the most important thing in life? And you and I know that kids have the four existential questions that kids want answered and every adult wants answered as you alluded to where did i come from does my life have meaning is there right and wrong and where am i going what happens after i die and i love that you talk about the importance of teaching them about god and giving your family this noble vision of life as a way of sort of securing teaching kindness to kids because every parent wants their kids to be kind and the truth of the matter is if you know God and love God and love the Lord your God with all your heart and um, love your neighbor as yourself those are the two best tools you can possibly have as far as teaching kindness to your kids so I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that you're bold in writing about that all right parents Time to get social. I want to hear from you and interact with you. You know I love answering your questions. You can connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Meg Meeker MD. Or if you have a question, send it to Ask Meg at MegMeekerMD.com. Today, I have a great question from Michelle. Dr. Meg, as a single mom, I feel super discouraged listening to your podcast. While I agree that as a parent, I should spend as much time as possible with my two-year-old son, you haven't ever acknowledged, or maybe I've missed it, the reality for some parents is that their kids have to be in daycare full-time. I don't get child support, and while I try to have good, strong male role models for my son, his father, a pastor wants nothing to do with us. I have to work in order to provide for his basic needs. What advice do you have for me and others like me who just don't have the option to be home more? Well, Michelle, thank you so much for writing. And first of all, please accept my apology if you feel discouraged, because the truth of the matter is I never want to discourage parents. My job is to tell you parents what your kids want and what your kids need. And you as a single mom have an incredibly hard life and I in no way want you to 
ever feel judged. I have the utmost respect for single moms and single dads. Now, my purpose in stressing the importance of parents spending as much time as possible with kids is this. It is in no way to denigrate you. There are many voices in your world and in every parent's world convincing you, parents, that your kids really don't need to be with you. They're better off on soccer fields, with friends, doing athletics, arts, crafts, ballet, whatever you think. And this is not true. Also, there is a lot of competition for your son's attention, electronics, sports, activities, school, on and on and on. And what I've learned over the past 30 years of watching a whole generation of kids grow up is this, strong character and emotional health develop in kids from a good relationship with their parents, not on soccer fields, at play practice, on social media, playing video games or whatever one out of a hundred things they could be doing. And many parents feel that their kids don't need much time with them. And this isn't true. That's why I drill down on the message that your kids need face-to-face in the room time with you as much as possible. Also, there are many parents who choose to spend many, many hours away from their kids every week, and they fail to realize that kids want more time with their parents. That's not your situation. You're trying to survive, and your son will soon know that you are away from him at work, not by choice, but because of necessity. And this makes an enormous difference. You know, kids get what makes the family run. Kids get when their parents want to be with them and when they don't want to be with them. And I want you to go back and listen to my podcast with Christy Wright and Rachel Cruz. Here's why. Christy Wright grew up with a single mom who took her to work with her um, because she paid all the bills and she worked very, very hard. And she took her, and she took Christy to work with her and she ended up being the greatest role model in Christy's life. And Christy now as an adult has a very successful business, credits her mother with teaching her and showing her how to work hard. And she also has a fabulous relationship with her mother. So here's the thing, Michelle, be encouraged. You are a really dialed in mom and that's huge for your son. And that tells me you're an awesome mom. So when you're with your son, make the time count. I think you're already doing that. And I I think you know that. Be present when you're with your son. That means don't read your emails. Don't veg out in front of the TV. Don't be on your phone the whole time. Be present with him. And also, as hard as life is, make time for fun with your son. You know, schedule in some fun. Go on bike rides, go to the park, go to a movie. You know, just enjoy him because at the end of the day, what your son really wants is he wants a mom who works hard for him and for the family. And he also wants to know that you enjoy his company. Your son is going to fly. He's going to be great. I hope that helps and I hope that encourages you. And remember parents, as long as our kids know that they are always our number one priority, they'll do really well in life. Parents, you know I love answering your questions, so please keep sending them in to me. You can email me any question, nothing is off limits, to askmeg at megmeekermd.com. Again, that's askmeg at megmeekermd.com. I want to thank my awesome guest, Dr. Tom Lacona. You need to check out his book, How to Raise Kind Kids. He has written a lot of other wonderful books, but that is one of my personal favorites. So before we go, let's recap my points to ponder. One, teach kindness. Two, model kindness. And three, expect kindness in your home. So until next time, parents, always remember... Great kids are raised, not born. Hey, this is Bobby, producer of Meg Meeker's Parenting Great Kids podcast. 
We hope you've enjoyed listening, and thanks to you, Dr. Meg's Parenting Revolution has grown to over a million downloads. You can like Dr. Meeker on Facebook and follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Meg Meeker MD. As a reminder, go to MegMeekerMD.com and sign up for her newsletter for giveaway opportunities and updates. And don't forget to share the podcast, write us a review, and click subscribe so you won't miss an episode. 